an illegal tinder, an infrared heat-seeking missile, a desk that can shoot, and even a poker cheating device are items that are super rare, but they're also super illegal. These are the most super rare illegal items on Pawn Stars. What do we got? I have some political memorabilia, the Secret Service ID for J. Howard McGrath, Attorney General of the United States. Okay. Some letters signed to him by J. Edgar Hoover, Hubert Humphrey. <laughs> <laughs> I came into the pawn shop today to try and sell some political memorabilia from the Attorney General of the United States, J. Howard McGrath. I really don't know what they're worth. Kind of had a number of a thousand in my head, but we'll see how it goes. McGrath was the attorney general under Truman, late 40s, early 50s. I don't think McGrath was actually in the Secret Service, but being the attorney general, I'm sure he could get any credentials he wanted. He was the top law enforcement official. So Truman, picking him to be attorney general, cronyism, you think? <laughs> this Dr. Strange looking customer brings in some very questionable items. It's the kind of collection that'll make you nervous just to be around it. Crossing here. And this right here is. I believe that is half of a counterfeit $10 bill. They signed it to the Attorney General. You sure it's counterfeit and just not a bad misprint? But counterfeit money? That's a whole different story. It's a federal offense to use a counterfeit bill, so I'm assuming you can't own one. Yeah, it's counterfeit. All American currency, they throw silk rag in with the paper. So if you pick up a bill and you look at it closely, you'll see little red and blue lines all over it. If that's not there, it's not real. Okay. This is an amazing collection. You just never see stuff like this, but it scares the hell out of me. I mean, counterfeit money and secret service credentials. This is the kind of stuff that can get me in hot water. You got some- Even among this man's questionable items, some are more notorious than others. Rick can spot which item it is, and he has little doubt about its legality. And these three things right here, I really want to get checked out. I'm not 100% positive, but I'm pretty sure it's a felony to own this thing. Let me go make a phone call. I'll be right. right back. Thanks. I'm really hoping it's legal to keep this stuff because it's awesome. If it checks out, I'll definitely make an offer. What do we have today? Well, this is a counterfeit bill, so... <laughs> counterfeit? Yeah. J. Howard McGrath. Interesting. You know who he was. Attorney General of the United States. Well, he was that too. He was three-term governor of Rhode Island. He was a senator as well. Oh, okay. On railroads. It was a fairly active time. Now, let me take a look here. Mark, the expert, comes in to give his opinion on these suspicious items. His reaction to the $100 bill is enough to tell you all you need to know about it. Oh yes, this is his Secret Service credential. The embossing the seal is right on this, so this is all right. Secret Service passes like this. Normally, they either have a stripe across them or they're marked retired, so it's an interesting one because it's all completely intact. So obviously, these guys were probably involved in whatever case this came out of, and... Can we shred it? No. Best thing to do is turn that in to the, the Secret Service. Okay. Thanks for coming in, Mark. Not a problem. You're the best. Appreciate it. Alrighty. Mark gives his expert opinion about the items, and it comes with a strong warning to stay clear of the very illegal legal tender. Go with these. I'd like to sell them. How much you want for them? I'd like $1,000. <laughs> this one's not stamped retired. You heard him say it was rare. This is not exactly a badge, so it's gonna be a little bit harder to sell. It's sort of on the fringe of badge collecting. Yeah, I mean, I, I need to get five. Yeah, I'll give you 500 bucks. Good deal. All right, you wanna write them up? Rick manages to make a deal without compromising himself. Now, the real question is whether the seller will turn over the counterfeit note to the right authorities. These Secret Service credentials are amazing. Even though McGrath is not exactly a household name, there's collectors out there who love stuff like this. So what exactly do we have here? They were attached to the F4 Phantoms. And should I call Homeland Security now, or? I'm coming down to the pawn shop to sell my- Rick, this is first. Uh, no, we've never had a guidance since for a missile. I've never really needed one. <laughs> So this was attached to the F-4? Yes, and they were used to guide the Sidewinder missiles. Sealed bid, he won it for $25. Okay. As he's loading them into the truck, he noticed some were heavy. He opened it up, and these were inside. That's incredible. 
but I gotta dig a little bit more before I have the Air Force come breathing down my neck. A woman walks in with something that belongs to the NSA, and it's not a regular citizen. Rick doesn't know how to act around this item, which may or may not be illegal. All right, this is really cool, but do you have paperwork from the Department of Defense or somebody saying you can own this thing? Yes. They were supposed to have been destroyed. Yes. I believe they're totally safe. Okay. <laughs> um, it is cool, though. I mean, I really do dig it. Before this, you had to see your enemy. Yep. These came out. If this really is a Cold War era heat seeker, there's all kinds of people I could sell it to. Aviation collectors, war collectors, technology geeks. But I have to know for sure. Is this thing what she says it is? Or if it's legal to buy? The woman's come prepared for one of the most important questions. Is she allowed to have such a weapon? Let's just say her paperwork did the talking for her. Interesting, I'll tell you that. What I'm trying to figure out is, what the hell are you gonna do with it? I mean, are they worth any money? I mean, I just don't wanna end up with federal agents knocking on my door. Hey guys, how are we doing? This is it, the heat-seeking device for an F-4. I'm really surprised that you own this. Do you have documents that say that you can have this? Well, what you do, we have a letter that says we won them. Okay. They showed me documents of paperwork, so they're legal to own it. It's very rare to have that outside of a military base, let alone in a pawn shop in Las Vegas. The expert is equally impressed with the woman's paperwork. He had to see it for himself to believe it. These work. This item is basically the top foot and a half of a nine-foot heat-seeking missile. If we were to take off this dome, there would be a mirror in there with another reflecting mirror. They would actually spin, and behind that, we've actually got a filter. And then we expanded the two missiles, and we were the first in the world to do that. So instead of shooting from hundreds of feet, we can now shoot out to a mile, mile and a half. So obviously that gave us an advantage early in Vietnam. Off a German base, an AIM-9 went missing. It was trucked past the Iron Curtain, and a year later, the communists had the exact same missile. So that advantage we had initially in Vietnam, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so is there... This piece of military equipment has a lot of history behind it. These heat-seeking projectiles were made to relentlessly chase after any unlucky sort of heat. Value uh, for this thing. It's in good shape. On a 1 to 10 scale as a fighter pilot, I'd give it about a 9. It's, it's pretty neat. Uh, no one really has one. It's really commercial value, nothing. I'll be honest with you. Thanks, man. You bet. Right. Appreciate you coming out. Good to see you. As a fighter pilot who has fired the AIM-9 missile, it's exciting to see this. If you find a person that really is into it, perhaps an old Vietnam F-4 pilot or somebody like myself, that could be a perfect item for him. The expert gives his honest opinion on the infrared heat-seeking missile. He doesn't have anything commercially concrete to give Rick, but Rick still appreciates the effort. What are you looking to get out of this? Oh, about $3,000? No. <laughs> um... You don't think this is worth more money than $500? I, I think it's a neat piece of history, but it's an antiquated thing that's going to sit. Hmm. I'm psyched I got this. It's something that'll definitely get people in the door and have them talking. Even if I don't sell it, I'm just as happy having it sit on my shelf. Rick wants this missile badly, and you can see that from how he ruthlessly negotiates the price he'll pay for it. Huh? What is it, like a girdle or something? <laughs> <laughs> well, kind of. They were used to cheat at playing poker cards or something like that. This is a pretty old device. It's about 1900s. I'm wanting to sell this anywhere from to show anybody because it was illegal, so it was always stuffed in a drawer. Where did you get this? My husband's, and he gave it to him and asked him to hold it for him. OK. I mean, the day they started gambling, people started gambling, I assume mm -hmm. to cards, marking cards. And it, it's always been that. Looks like a mechanic. The next item to walk into the pawn shop is one that should be banned in all of LA. How did she get such a cool looking device? It cheated cards. It's definitely cool. I mean, there's some really neat little engineering here. Um, do you know how any of this stuff works? I have absolutely no idea. Okay, I mean, we have like a little court. Vegas may be a gambling town, but this is a little out of both of our wheelhouses. I'm gonna have to call a friend of mine to come down and take a look at it. There's no way either of us are gonna know what this is worth. Yeah? I mean, it's... Who would you be calling? So I'm kind of concerned that the guys want to call a magician, and I'm not sure... If... I can see why Rick called me in for a cheating device, because in magic, that's really what we do. We kind of cheat people out of reality. 
He went up and down the Barbary Coast, the San Francisco coastline, cheating people. He came up with the first type called the Kaplinger Holdout. It was a card holdout, which meant San Francisco card holdout, made in the 1920s, 1930s. All right? Well, do you know how it worked? The expert doesn't look like Merlin, but he's the next best thing. The owner of the contraption didn't believe a magician is the right person to give an opinion, but the magician proved her wrong. Yes, I do know how it works, but I actually brought a deck of cards with me. Cool. So here's what happened. This, all right, see how it pinches it. And this goes against your forearm. It should slide out. So pull it. Pull it? Yeah, you can pull. Oh, so cool. that comes out? Your secret right. has been told. <laughs> <laughs> he made the device for them, and they all went out cheating people. They all get caught, and they went to jail for the rest of their lives. So what do you think it's worth? Uh, these are really cool, because there's not many around. The magician is knowledgeable about the capabilities of this cheating device, a lot more knowledgeable than the owner. If there's anybody that can properly appraise the item, then it's this spiky-haired expert. This is an amazing shape, so a lot of people use them for museum pieces or they use them as a cool thing in their home to display. What you're looking for is anywhere between... All right, uh, he said it would go for like, what, 15 to 22? Retail. <laughs> that, that was like retailing it. I would give you 800 bucks. No, I give you like 800 bucks. It's it's going to be difficult to sell. You can always put it back in the socket. Well, you you don't have, thirteen. You, you hurt the guy. Well, you know, I've learned something by coming here. I figured out I need to be a better negotiator. But all in all, I think it was worth it. Hey, how's it going? Good. How are you? Rick is blessed with the magical ability of negotiations. He managed to lowball the customer and still get away with it. Now that's a true magic trick. So what do we got here? Well, it's a desk, but it's not really a desk. Yes, when you push down on the inkwell, a bullet fires out through the trap door. Where in the world did you get this? I got it in an estate sale. When we got it home, it's not why loaded. Why are you sticking your face in there? Uh, th uh, this is why I'm keeping it at an angle here. You're really not going to stop anybody if you shoot them in the thigh with a small 22 like that. Because there's no barrel for back pressure to build up to send the bullet flying. I have never seen one before. The gun desk is a classic illegal item on the show. The owner just wants to satisfy her curiosity and maybe make some money while at it. No idea what this thing is. I only buy guns that are made 1898 and back. The problem I have here is I don't know the date this thing was made because I am just completely lost here. Not at all. I really want this desk. It's one of the coolest things I've ever seen. But until I know for sure it was made in 1898 or before, I can't. Rick knows he has to double check this desk or else he might wake up to the feds and ATF at his door. So where's the gun? This is the gun. What? <laughs> My name is Sean Rich. I own Tortuga Trading Incorporated and I specialize in antique arms and armor. Do not think that a bullet hitting this broke that in half. And if it did, it would have blown this completely off. Anything manufactured before 1898 is okay. You can ship it, you can buy and sell, no problem. Registered through an FFL licensed dealer with the- The desk is sounding more illegal by the minute and even experts don't know what to make of it. The barrel is so tiny, but it's open-ended means that it could shoot a projectile, and that's an issue. And the other part of this is that it looks to be in that 1890s to about 1910 era, oh, but good. I couldn't buy and sell. Oh, I'd love to do that then. I'll, okay. That's what I'll do. I wish I could help you out more. It's just one of those things. The law is the law. Hopefully, she'll get it deactivated and bring it back, because I would love to have it. Rick is fascinated by this interesting but illegal table. But after the expert's advice, he knows that he has to let this one go. Tar here, and I wasn't sure whether or not I could legally sell it. Yeah, I've never had anyone ask me if it's legal to sell their guitar, and that would explain why. It's a tortoise shell. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> if I was able to sell it today, that money will go towards my daughter's college. Where in the world did you get this? I bought it at a pawn shop. For centuries and centuries, people have used tortoise shell for everything. I mean, it was really prized for a long time. Tortoise shell was real popular back in the day, but some tortoises became endangered. So in the early 70s, the trade in tortoise shell was banned. John walks into the pawn shop with what may be the most illegal guitar in the country. Rick certainly wasn't expecting to see this in his pawn shop. The way the light goes through it, it's browns and reds and oranges. You have to think about it. A bald eagle feather is a $10,000 fine. 
It doesn't matter if you thought it was a turkey feather. If it turns out to be a bald eagle feather, they're going to take it from you. They're going to find you 10,000 bucks. I tell you, ignorance is no excuse for the law. I've seen a lot of instruments come through the store, but never anything like this. Making a new guitar out of tortoiseshell would be against the law. So if I can verify that this is old enough and legal to own, then we're looking at an extremely rare find here. Normally, Rick wouldn't ever want to touch anything that's remotely illegal, but he knows that there's a chance his pawn shop could get this guitar legally, and he would like to take that chance. What are you doing? All right. This is the guitar I called you about. Wow. Sea turtle, maybe? Cool. Very cool. You guys usually call me down when they have anything with strings on it. I used to play in a bunch of different punk rock bands when I was younger, so it's kind of surprising I can even remember anything, let alone all the stuff I've learned about guitars over the years. So do you have any idea how these sound? You know, I know that bluegrass guys prefer a real tortoiseshell pick because of the sound, the tone of the pick. It looks like it'd be a weird scale length. The neck looks really short, but they're not having strings on it. I, you could probably get some money for it. And somebody did a lot of work on the inlay. You can see the rosetta pattern around the sound hole matches the binding and stuff. But uh, this is kind of a tough one. And paid like 20 grand in fines for selling this stuff illegally. That's what I would be concerned with, you know? <laughs> All right. Thanks, man. No problem. Catch you guys later. Jesse's expert opinion comes as a strong warning to the Pawn Star. Rick and the seller could get in trouble if they made a deal on this guitar. Good luck with it, man. All right, thank you. I'm going to look at my options as to what I can and can't do with it. I've got two girls, and I don't want jail visits from them. No deal will be made on this illegal guitar. Both parties are okay with that, as it beats going to jail. German spy camera. Very Inspector Gadget of you. I came to the pawn shop today to sell my 1950s Minox 3 jersey. Where'd you get it? It was actually uh, given to me from my mom, given to her from her father, who was in the military in Germany in the 1950s. So how's it work? And it loads that photo right onto the film. Pretty much just like how every other old camera works. <laughs> yeah, yeah, pretty standard, yeah. <laughs> Ever since the James Bond movies, if this camera was used in the field by an actual secret agent, it could definitely be worth some money to the right collector. Now, as far as... Espionage drives the fine line between what is legal and what's illegal. This customer brings in an antique spy camera that looks like something out of a 90s James Bond movie. Really being a spy camera, I'm going to have to call a little bit of bull Spy cameras aren't sold to the public. They're made by the CIA or the German equivalent of the CIA. This isn't a super valuable camera, but it's unique enough that some photography collector out there would probably really like to have it. What do you want for it? No, I was looking to get about 100 bucks for it. You have Bill McCord's name and social security number carved on it. I'm you assuming sure? you're not Bill McCord? I'm not. Second of all, somebody engraved something in there right there and removed it. For me to buy something and say serial number remove. All right, man. So I appreciate you coming in, man. Hey, I appreciate your time, man. Thank you very much. I don't think this camera is stolen, but in the eyes of the law, it might as well be. Scratch off serial numbers are a huge red flag in the pawn business. And to tell you the truth, I just don't want to deal with it. I've got a Penn State University. There are too many reasons why Corey can't buy this spy camera. The best one is the fact that he doesn't want to go to jail over an item, especially one that's less than 100 bucks. It's 90 years old. It really works well. You know, things like this have a tendency to sit. It's going to be a tough sell. I mean, who exactly buys one of these things? You know, I'll give you 100 bucks for the thing. Yeah, I'll do 125. OK, I'll take it. All right, thank well, you. Let's go write it up. Spending my money again. I settled on $125 a night. This is a vintage wine and apple cider press. You can actually make un vino increíble para tu casa con esto. You probably can't find much on it because one of the secrets to wine is you want to just kind of do it the way they did it a thousand years ago. Next up, this customer walks in with what has to be one of the most questionable stamps ever. The Romans or the Greeks had something very similar to it. You can imagine something like this. It was a lot more sanitary, a lot more uh, efficient than actually stomping on them with right. your feet. So how old is this? From the people that I bought it, they said they had it for over 50 years themselves. Whether this wine press is brand new or really old, it's still in decent condition and it makes wine. So really, any collector would want this thing. Five ninety-five. Okay. Yeah. Um, any particular reason you want that number? Or? It just sounds good. Yeah, you know? I, I, I like it that. Sounds good to me. Three fifty. The man manages to close a deal on these barely legal stamps. It's not what he wanted, but he'll make do with it. 
Uh, how about the uh, 500? Um, all right, sweet, but nothing in them. <laughs> oh, we have Casper's whiskey made by honest North Carolina people. Mm -hmm. It's definitely cool, man. Okay. And usually they didn't sell it in bottles. Usually it was like either two and a half gallon or five gallon big, you know, ceramic jugs. So America has a toxic relationship with alcohol, and this caused a time when it was even illegal. Decades later, everything associated with that sober time is still looked at with caution, like this moonshine still brought in by a customer. Bottles. It's usually right. the big jugs. As far as bottle collectors, this is a big deal right here. Okay, so this is um, well over 100 years old. It's hand blown. No, did you know that the purple glass, why it turns purple? Everything about it's different. So this one I don't want. It's okay. just too tough to sell. How much you want for this one? I left it five. Five hundred? Yeah. And I knew when I got into it ten years ago. Okay. Um, three fifty. The most illegal thing in this transaction was the fact that this kid just made a neat profit off of Rick. Now that's something that you don't see every day. I'm coming into the pawn shop to try to sell my old Taylor whiskey bottle from the Prohibition era. What's better than 80 year old whiskey? Not these mixed cocktails that these city boys drink. You know why it says medicinal purposes only? I don't know exactly. The Prohibition Act outlawed alcohol. Or you got your doctor to write your prescription for it. A fixed RX label through opening. So I guess this is where the like prescription label would go. And then you, know, you go to the pharmacy, you fill your prescription, go home, and you get drunk. We have another item from the Prohibition era, an interesting time that introduced the world to medicinal whiskey. Do you know when the mixed drink became popular? No. It was during Prohibition because the whiskey was just rock gut, the gin was bathtub gin. It just tasted so bad. <laughs> Rick, I'm fixing the kick, you <laughs> I've read about medicinal whiskey. I've never actually seen a bottle. I really want it. You think so? Yeah. Here's the deal. I'm just taking a shot in the dark. Uh, I, I never really knew what I was going to get for it. And uh, that was more than... The seller doesn't mind letting this bottle go, and Rick doesn't mind buying it. It was illegal decades ago, so this is a pretty nice thing to own, even if it's just for show. Things besides just face, I look at the clothes, I look at the background, I check... Yes, so do I. I look at everything. <sighs> it's a copy. To be done, and um, hopefully I'll be on a little shopping spree later on. There are times on Pawn Stars where sellers come in with big hopes, and ends up knowing that what they so treasured isn't even real to begin with. From a Karen who thought she will get thousands of dollars out of a fake contract, to another who came in with a stock certificate, here are some angry and disappointed Karens on Pawn Stars. Stock Certificate I have a stock certificate that was made out to one of the greatest American authors, Mark Twain. So Karen came into the pawn shop with a certificate she claimed was a stock certificate from the Goodman Gold and Silver Mining Company in Virginia City, Nevada. And Rick couldn't help but tell her what Mark Twain said about it. Do you know what Mark Twain said about gold mines? No. Mark Twain said that a gold mine is a hole in the ground with a liar at the bottom. <laughs> she needed the money for some shopping that she had to do and thought that the ticket might sell for a good amount. Where did you get this? Well, my husband went out to an estate sale and he bought some book. He found it. When Rick couldn't help but ask where she got the ticket, she told him that it was her husband who bought some book from an estate sale and found this ticket inside the books. He was an incredible guy. His name is not Mark Twain. No, Samuel it's, it's Clemens. Samuel Clemens. You know what Mark Twain means. After conducting a background check on Mark Twain and learning about his actual name and his status as the best American author in the history of literature, Rick was now ready to make the deal. What would you like to do with it? I'd like to sell it. Now, how much did you want for it? $500. Okay. The woman wanted $500 for the ticket, but Rick had some concerns regarding the ticket. As Mark Twain's real name was different, and this was the ticket he used to buy some stock shares, it was concerning why he wrote Mark Twain there and not his real name. Would you put that stock certificate in your pen name or your real name? And then Karen told him that she read that they let him write his pen name just as an encouragement for him. But Rick wasn't going to buy it. My other concern is I have never seen a stock certificate printed like this. Back in those days, if you owned stock in a company, you presented your stock and your dividends were paid. 
If it was printed this simply, anybody could counterfeit it. Just everything about it screams fake. And that was it. Karen went away disappointed and angry because the stock certificate turned out to be a fake. Or maybe she was just disappointed that she couldn't fool the Pawn Stars. A picture of Abraham Lincoln. How you doing? Hi. Hey, can I help you? Yeah, I'd like to sell a picture of Mary. This man came in to sell a picture of Mary and Abraham Lincoln, and Chumley couldn't help but boast about his knowledge on this matter. I thought Abe only took photos by himself. What are you talking about? Well, he's right about that. Are you jealous? According to the seller, the photo is from 1863, and he himself is a collector of old photos, especially from the 19th century. He has a total of 11 photos, so he thought, why not go and try to sell one? This is really intriguing. An ambrotype, you know what that means? I just know that in ambrotypes, it took like 30 minutes to develop, and they had to like... What Chum knew was that these kinds of pictures took 30 minutes to develop, and the subjects had to sit straight for that entire time. Yeah, that's how the pictures were taken back then. While Chum and Rick had their own war going on, the seller couldn't help but smile all the time. No, you'd be spinning too much, girl. I, I don't like, know where you get your history from. Abe did not have a lot of money. After the war was over, Rick was in for the real question. So, how much do you want for this? I feel it's one in a million, so I'm asking a million. Whoa. That was a little too much money, but maybe it was worth that much. I mean, I wouldn't know, of course. I'm no expert. Speaking of experts, Rick called one for this deal. I can call someone and take a look at it. I have kind of a renowned expert on photo identification. When the expert came in, she couldn't help but admire the picture. But after a while, she started noticing some issues with it. The issue with this guy being Abraham Lincoln, you can see that his nose is a little bit different, his eyes are a little bit different. She told them about everything that seemed wrong with the picture. Not just Abraham, but Mary Todd's face looked different as well. But the seller wasn't convinced. There are some things about Abraham's face. He had a nose that was crooked, and he, he definitely has one in this photo as well. Now the expert Karen knew why the man thought the photograph was real, but it wasn't. She tried explaining it to him again and again. I know why you think this is Abraham Lincoln, because he has that sort of gaunt shape to his head. So she tried using facial comparison software, which overlays one face on top of the other and determines if they're alike or not. But the man wasn't ready to believe the software either, claiming that he had already checked everything himself. I use a caliper and I, right. I, I check the eyes and they're a match. Okay. Now the experts showed how the picture of Mary did not match, and it was so obvious that it was a fake. However, the seller had other things to say. Well, I don't want to be difficult here, but I feel I am an expert. I look for other things besides just face. I look at the clothes, I look at the background, I check. Yes, so do I. And that is where the experts started getting angry as well. The man was in no mood to hear that the picture he treasured was actually a fake. I look at everything. <laughs> okay. And it doesn't stop there. It's not a problem. It's your career. You have a right to discredit yourself. But you know what? But I've been doing this for a really long time. Okay. Now the man thought it was worth a million dollars. But as far as everyone could see, it wasn't even real to begin with. Rick decided to intervene and let the expert go before things escalated further. Okay, so you heard Marine. Okay, so all right, appreciate it. Like I said, we can agree to disagree. Yeah, thank you very much. I all appreciate right. it. Have thank a good you. one. The deal wasn't done, and both the seller and expert left quite disappointed. Ivory Tusk. Uh, what do we got here? An ivory tusk. This woman came in with something she claimed to be an ivory tusk, which she thought belonged to very old times and would be worth a handsome amount of money. Hand carved, I would hope that I could get somewhere between 1000 and 1500 for it. So according to her knowledge, it was hand carved and she wanted to pawn it for seven to 10 days. So how'd you get this thing? I bought it in Taipei. She bought it somewhere in Taipei. And when asked how much she got it for, her answer was a lot. A lot. <laughs> okay. But that's when Rick told her the bad news. Fortunately, it's not ivory. What do you mean it's not ivory? This is bone, it's pieced together bone and it's made for the tourist trade. It took Rick literally two seconds to tell that it wasn't ivory, and the woman had been scammed if what she said was right. Told it was ivory. Ivory would be a lot heavier than this. Who says? Says me. Since she couldn't believe what Rick said, he had to show her and tell her multiple reasons. It was obvious that what she bought for a lot of money wasn't ivory. See the panels, the way they come together like that? Well, if it was real ivory, it would just be one solid piece. After minutes of explaining it to her, it started to look like she was now seeing the obvious things she couldn't before. 
But the thing is, even if it was ivory, Rick still wouldn't have been interested in buying it. I don't like the process of getting ivory. I don't like the politics of it. I don't like anything about it. Still, he thought he should ask what the woman was trying to get out of it. Thousand to fifteen. There's no way. I would loan you like a hundred dollars on this. No. And well, they couldn't make any deal, and the woman went out rather upset about the situation. Elvis Presley contract. I have a contract here signed by Elvis Presley in 1955. So this Karen came in with a contract, which, according to her, was signed by Elvis Presley in 1955, way back during his popular times. So are you a big fan? Oh, absolutely. And he was good looking. For Karen, this contract was as rare as anything can be. So she was looking to get around eight to $10,000 for it. But was the contract really worth that much money? I guess we'll have to find out. Where did you get the contract at? I have a friend. She had a friend who was in the music industry, and he gave her this contract saying that it must be worth some money and that she needed to get a check somewhere. Did you ever see him play? Yes, I did. I saw him in his early years live, and he looked fantastic. Of course she did. It looks so obvious by the way she's talking about him. She sure had a big crush on him. His music, it had a fantastic beat. Everybody loved to dance to it, and he danced wonderfully. So Karen loved Elvis. Rick thought he was the coolest rock star in history, and he was definitely interested in making the deal. A contract for Elvis Presley to play at the City Auditorium, Beaumont, Texas, June 20th and 21st, 1955. The contract looked pretty neat, and it was a cool piece of history as well. Moreover, it was on a single page, so it could be framed very easily, and it had Elvis's signature as well. It was a perfect deal to make. So what do you want to do with it? I'd like to sell it. And how much were you looking to get out of it? Well, I'd like to get eight to $10,000 for it. Eight to $10,000, as we all know, and to Rick, it was a reasonable figure. But he had to get it checked out by an expert before making the deal. Is this it? Yep. Looking forward to it all day. The guys gave me a phone call. They said they had an Elvis Presley contract. The expert looked just as excited as the seller and Rick were and said that it was easily worth around $15,000 if it was authentic. But to be sure of that, he had to examine it closely. Sure, though, is to see if it's an original, because if it's not an original, it's not going to have any value. So let's take a closer look here. And after so much inspection, the expert came up with this. It's a copy. The ink wasn't from a pen. It was from a Xerox machine. The woman was just too disappointed to even react for a few moments. I'm heartbroken, completely. This makes me feel terrible when this happens, someone especially as sweet as you. And that's when the woman started crying. She had to leave with her contract and nothing but a heavy heart. Guitars. Hello. A couple of guitars. Guitars. Yeah. This woman came in with two guitars she claimed were signed by the Rolling Stones and 16 country legends. Country legends. You can see Winona Judd, Willie Nelson. So it just sounded like the person whose guitar it was took it to every music legend in the country and had it signed by them. So yeah, it sounded cool. Not just to the woman, but to Rick, too. And the Rolling Stones are amazing. I mean, 60 years, they're still going strong. If the signatures were all actual signatures on a guitar, then that could be a big deal. He just never see it. Where did you get these? So the woman got them from a charity auction for a children's profit foundation or something. And now she wanted to see if they were actually worth something. And upon asking how much she wanted for them, she said this. I would like 5,500 for the Rolling Stone one and 10,000 for the country music legend. Rick said it was always a red flag for him if anyone comes with things they had brought from charity auctions. So he had to get these checked. What's up, Rick? I sent you the pictures. Yes. We got all these country music autographs and the Rolling Stones. Now, the expert had already taken a good look at all those autographs and thought they were really cool and all, but there was a teeny tiny problem. Bad. To me, it looks like wherever these came from, the same person had signed these. Unfortunately, the signatures were not authentic, and the expert said that those guitars were worth nothing. All right. Well, that's a little disappointing. I'm sorry. I wish they were real because I would make money and you would make money and everyone would be happy. But you think of some money in the charity. And even though the deal wasn't done and the woman was a little hurt, she did at least give some money to charity, right? Angry Male Karen. Hey. How you doing, gentlemen? Oh, pretty good. This guy walked into the shop with a sculpture and he had no idea about it. He just wanted to sell it, you know? Do you know much about it? I don't know what to tell you about that. But Rick knew everything about it. 
He knew it was a statue called Pegasus with Perseus on it, the guy from mythology who killed Medusa. The helmet he wore made him invisible. So when the seller heard all this, here's what he said. Perseus was the mythological figure that killed Medusa. He was made in 1888 uh, by the French sculptor Emile Picard. The sculpture was so awesome that even the old man was really impressed by it, you know? It says made in USA below it. This was not made in 1888. What you've seen and what you can prove is two different stories. Turns out the statue was made by Picard back in 1880, which makes it pretty rare and potentially valuable. But then Rick noticed something. What doesn't look right? Is there's some pity right here, and that crack right there is from when they casted it. It didn't happen later. So there were some issues, and that's what made Rick doubt if the artwork was genuine. You know? You see this? Yeah. It says "Made in USA" below it. This was not made in 1888. Rick eventually concluded that there's a chance the statue was recast about 40 or 50 years ago and not an original piece. This made the seller really angry. What you've seen and what you can prove is two different stories. I don't care what you say. Even after explaining everything, the seller just couldn't accept that what he had wasn't the original piece. I don't care what you tell me, but I know you're full of You know? <sighs> this made Rick furious because all he wanted to do was tell the guy the truth, but some people just don't want to listen. Um, that's just what I see. We really appreciate you bringing it in. Still, Rick kept repeating the facts about the artwork and this is what he got in response. You know, well, it's all right, Antoine. I got it. I got it. The old man and the guard had to step in to calm down the seller, who was blaming everything on Rick. But it's not for us. That's all I can tell you. And the guy left with the statue, thinking it was the pawn shop's loss, not his own. This book would retail. It, it has a value of $20,000. If you could live with 5000 that's what I'll pay. That's all I'm willing to risk. Deal. Deal? All right. You're looking at probably about 15000 Pawn Stars is a show where they buy old items from people and then try to sell them for profit. However, there are times when they scam people and end up making huge profits as well. With some such examples, let's start today's video where Pawn Stars scammed their customers. Isaac Newton's book. A man came into the pawn shop with a book that belonged to Isaac Newton, claiming it was from 1546. He didn't really know the book's worth, but had an idea that it could be worth thousands. If we open up the front cover, this is the book plate for Isaac Newton. Needless to say, the old man looked pretty interested in the book too. I imagine a book this old is pretty valuable, but if Isaac Newton owned it, the sky's the limit. So the old man called in an expert to have a look at the book. The expert couldn't help but notice that the book was actually very old and looked genuine. However, he had a bit of bad news for the seller, too. Now, there's a little bit of bad news. This is not the original binding. Uh, this book was restored. The book might not have its original binding and could have been restored. Nonetheless, it was the real one and did belong to Isaac Newton. Of what kind of value do we have on this thing? The book would retail. It, it has a value of $20,000. Now, the expert had stated the book's worth, but the old man had other things in mind. The seller asked for $15,000, but the old man made this offer. If you could live with $5,000, that's what I'll pay. The book eventually sold for $7,000, even though the expert told him it was worth much more. Let's guess the old man had a really nice dinner that day. Flintlock Pistol. Hey, how's it going? How you doing? Um, what do we have here? A man came into the shop with a pistol he didn't know much about, except it was old and there was a chance he could make good money from it. So Rick had to explain. It looks like 1700s, early 1800s, flintlock. The seller received it from his father, so he didn't have much knowledge about it and came into the pawn shop hoping to make $500 from it. How much are you looking to get out of this thing? Um, I want to see if I can get 500 even though the pistol was in really bad condition and someone had attempted a poor restoration job on it, Rick still had to call in an expert to determine its value. When the expert arrived, he was just as shocked as the others. No offense, but that is ugly. <laughs> <laughs> Although the pistol didn't look good to them, the expert informed them that it could be restored to become quite valuable, and Rick could sell it for around $3,000. I think it would be about $1,000. Once we restore it, if I can get it functional, I think it's at least 3000 Rick bought it for 200 bucks after some negotiations. 
and the seller wasn't interested in negotiating for a higher price either. Yeah, I'll do the 200. Okay, all right, sweet. Um, just follow me right over there. We'll do some paperwork. Afterwards, Rick sent the pistol for restoration, and it turned out to be in pretty good condition. With the restoration complete, the expert was now hopeful that Rick could easily get $5,000 for it. If this fires correctly, I think you get at least $5,000 for it. Surprisingly, the gun turned out to be functioning well too. So it was a great buy for Rick, but not so great for the man who sold it for so little. Hotchkiss Cannon A cannon! <laughs> what this man brought to the pawn shop wasn't just a cannon. It was an 1890s Hotchkiss Cannon, which was used in the Indian Wars. The cannon had sat in the front room of the man's house for years, and now he wanted to get rid of it and get some money. I bought this at an auction back east about 10 years ago, and now it's time to pass it on to someone else. So Rick called in the expert to assess the cannon's worth and determine its authenticity. Hey, Rick, how's it going? Hey, Rick, yeah, what do you got here? Um, a cannon. Uh -huh. <laughs> the cannon was the first modern self-contained cartridge firing gun in the American inventory. The rust on the cannon, the patina, and other indicators confirmed that it was a genuine cannon, exactly as the man had described. A good shootable gun like this, I would say $40,000 all day long. But Rick needed to see it fire first, so they all went to have it checked. The cannon was sold for $30,000, even though the seller could have gotten more if he had tried to negotiate. Rick probably made a significant profit on this one. Peacemaker Revolver Hey, how can I help you? I'd like to try and sell this Colt Revolver. So this man came in with this Colt Revolver. He was a bail bondsman, and somebody had put this gun up for collateral. They never paid off the bond, so they surrendered it. The man had paid $25,000 for it and was hoping he could at least get that much. This is a very early Colt single action army. This was, uh, this is 1870s. After telling the man everything Rick knew about the gun and the Colt single action army, Rick was ready to call in the expert to have the gun checked. It's really weird that you have two serial numbers on the gun, but if everything checks out, maybe we can make a deal. The expert came in and he couldn't help but admire the look of the gun. According to him, it was neat and gorgeous. When asked about the different serial numbers, the expert said it could just be a mistake, but it would only slightly decrease the value of the gun. I would safely guess that this would sell for $35,000. If it went above fifty, dollars it wouldn't really surprise me. The seller had asked for $25,000 before, and Rick was ready to give it to him. However, after hearing the expert, the man now wanted more. Maybe hey, what's your best price? You give me $40,000? I walk out the door. After a little bit of negotiation, the deal was done for $27,000, even though the expert clearly said that the gun could easily sell for 50 grand. Mustang. Earlier, I got a call from a guy selling a classic Mustang. So Corey and I are on our way to go check it out. So these two went to see the 1968 Mustang Fastback GT, the car that Steve McQueen used to drive. It's not the actual car Steve McQueen drove. One exactly identical to what he had. However, Corey did not look quite impressed by the condition the car was in. So what's the difference between this and a regular one? The man couldn't afford to restore it, so he had to sell it. And Rick was very interested in buying the car, too. All the muscle cars ever made, this has to be the prettiest. Rick tried explaining the difference to Corey, but he was just looking at a piece of scrap, unlike Rick and the old man. So Rick decided to move forward and called the expert to come and have a look at the car. Goodness gracious, a Steve McQueen machine. After checking the whole car out, the expert was convinced that it was what the old man said it was. Looks like a GT to me, brother, and it looks like a nice one, believe it or not. And in the exact same condition the car was in, it was easily worth twelve dollars to $15,000. The old man wanted twenty, dollars but he said he could come down to $12,000, so the price was still what he expected. I'll give you ten dollars for it. Oh, I, I gotta have more than that. I'll come down a little bit, but I can't come down that much. After a little bit of negotiation, the deal was done for $12,500, and the old man hoped that he could restore it because he couldn't. That's the least I can take, twelve five. All right, it's a deal. Okay. And this is what the car looked like after being restored. The expert asked for twenty two dollars and Rick bought it for twelve. dollars Meanwhile, the car was now worth way more than what Rick spent on it in total. Which means 22 to fix it, which means I'm in the entire thing, 34 dollars 
the way I'm looking at it, I think the thing's priceless. 1951 baseball. How I'm doing, Fry. Got a 1951 Yankees team signed baseball. So this man brought a 1951 Yankees team signed baseball. It had 22 signatures on it, and the man wanted to sell it, hoping he can get some money out of it. For him, it was just a family heirloom and did not mean much to him. It's a very interesting piece. What can you tell me about this? The condition of the ball was okay, with the signatures all fading out. But that was fine as the baseball was quite old, and it could have been through so many hands that the signatures were supposed to fade. I'd like to sell it. I think the ball's well worth $3,000. The man wanted $3,000 for it, but the old man had to get it checked first, so he called in the expert. It's not that I don't trust this guy. I don't trust nobody, especially when they're trying to sell me something. After minutes of checking the ball and matching the signatures, the expert came to the conclusion that the signatures were all genuine. I do believe that this is a genuine 1951 Yankees baseball. After the authentication, the old man started negotiations with the man, asking for $3,000 for the ball, and the old man offering him $800. But that was too little for the seller because he knew what the ball was worth and that the old man was trying to make a lot of profit from it. Well, I would respectfully decline. The offer will stand. You're welcome back anytime. I appreciate it. Space Explorer. What do we have here? I have here my uh, antique Space Explorer toy. So this man came in with his antique Mark's tin toy, hoping that he can get at least $3,000 for it. This is pretty damn cool. Do you know much about the Mark's Toy Company? After a whole lecture on the Mark's Tin Toy Company and how it was made in Japan after World War II when they were looking for things they could manufacture with whatever they had left, and toys were inexpensive, so they started out with them. So how much do you want for it? Found in an old toy magazine where it was listed for $5,500. Even though it was said to be worth $5,500 in that magazine, the seller thought $3,000 would be a good price for the toy. Price to ask for. Okay, this is one of the holy grails. This is one of the big ones. Now, Rick couldn't call on the expert that day, so he decided to take a risk and trust his own knowledge of these things to make a good deal out of it. But, um, I think I know enough about this thing. Rick offered the man a thousand bucks for the toy because the shape looked okay, but it was not perfect. So that brought the value of the toy down. 1750? No. The negotiation went on for a few minutes, and the deal was made at $12.50. Later, Rick decided to have the toy checked by the toy expert. I think I knew enough about this toy. Like I always say, a little bit of knowledge can be a really dangerous thing. At the first look, the expert knew that it was a nice piece of toy that Rick walked into the shop with. For him, it was extremely rare and enormously popular, and that was the perfect combo ever. So what'd you pay for this? $12.50. And if I lose money, it's your fault because you weren't here. Upon learning the price Rick bought it for, the expert gave him the good news that considering the condition the toy was in, it could easily be sold for $2,500. And yes, Rick can make more if he tries to. Samurai Sword. How are you today? You look familiar. Did you tell me something before? When this man came in, Corey knew he had seen him before. And that was when the man came and sold him the Grammy Award, which they later found out they could not sell. So Corey had to be very careful with this man. So I got to proceed very carefully here. You got something for you. Oh, sweet, a ninja sword. This time he brought in a samurai sword from 1600. He got it from a client who owed him 300 bucks and wanted to sell it because every time his wife gets angry, she looks at the sword. So yeah, better safe than sorry, I guess. I like to sell it because when my wife, when she's angry at me, she kind of looks at it. It was a Yatsudu sword, and the man wanted $5,000 for it. But with no expert around, it was a big risk. Either it would turn out to be a huge profit, or it would just be a waste of money. So Corey had to deal with it very carefully. That being said, my man, I'm seeing like 800 bucks. After heated negotiations, the man sold the sword for 1,500 bucks. Deal. Deal? All right, Chum, you wanna take care of him? Hell yeah, meet me at the counter. After making the deal, Corey had to get a check by the expert, who told him that the sword was just as genuine as he thought it might be and belonged to a very respected family who ruled for 20 to 30 years. When asked what it might be worth, the expert told him this. Well, in as-is condition, it's probably worth about five to 6,000 right now. Oh, it's a score, big hoss. But that wasn't all. 
The expert told him that if they got the sword restored, it would easily be worth around $15,000. So, for something bought for just $1,200, it was a hell of a lot of profit. Huh. That's it? Yeah. I'm gonna have to pass. Now that's bull****. This one? If you want one of these, I can get you one for $1,500. Uh, no. They're worth a lot more than that. Pawn Stars is the show where people come to sell out their beloved things. Normally, things stay pretty calm in the shop. But every now and then, things get intense and fights break out on the show. So, let's dive into today's video featuring some epic fights on Pawn Stars. Rotating Rifles What is this? They're hunting rifles. This man came into the shop with two rotating barrel hunting rifles. They were two shot 45 caliber percussion cap rifles. He claimed to be a collector of guns and said that he had picked them up from a guy. And now, after holding on to them for years, he wanted to sell them for a good price. These were developed in, I'm guessing, 1870-ish. Now, the man knew quite a lot about the rifles, including that one of them was left-handed, and there was a chance that it might have been built by William Hart. Just looking at them, you got to admit, they're damn cool. But to confirm all that information, the man's claims, and to see how much could be paid for the rifles, Rick had to call on the expert. I'm going to go get my call. All right, thank you. When the expert came, you remember the time when the seller came before, and they had a little bit of an argument. Now the expert was ready to have a look at what the seller brought this time. Some of the parts may be from the 1800s, but unfortunately these swivel barrel rifles were made from bits and pieces sometime in the 1900s. After careful examination, the expert came to the conclusion that these rifles were not made in the 1830s, but in the 1900s in fact. So they were not what the seller thought they were. All right, so what are they worth? For the expert, they were worth $750 at most for each rifle, and they were not worth more than that. The seller was not so happy about it. So and that would be your crybaby, whiny-ass opinion? The expert left, and now it was time for the negotiations. What do you want for him? Well, how about $2,000 for the pair? The seller came down from demanding $4,000 for the pair to $2,000 for both after hearing what the expert said. But it was still too much for Rick, who offered him $1,100 for both. Too low. I mean, they're really, really cool, and I, I, I do think they'll sell, but I mean, they are what they are. The man came down to $1,500, and after a little while, the deal was done at $1,400. And with that, the seller left, but not before commenting on the expert. It would be interesting to have the same appraisal guy. Sometimes I'd like to smack him, but that's just me. Pirate ship. I just came in from a guy selling a boat. It sounded cool, but no one else was around, so I just decided to go check it out myself. Chum Lee went to check out a boat, which was actually a street-legal pirate ship. The man owned a company that made these boats especially for bachelor parties and parades, but the man wanted money for making a new boat, so this one had to go. I'm asking $250,000. Why don't you come on aboard? All right. After asking the man about all the features the boat had and dismissing almost all the concerns Chum had, he decided to take a picture and send it to Rick. With Chum all interested in the boat that he could drive on the highway, he was ready for a drive in it. Chum's phone just keeps on going straight to voicemail. I'm sure it's all right, dude. Here, I'll text him. Since Chum's phone was not working, Corey decided to text him and tell him that he should not buy the boat. There, everything will be fine. Don't worry, I'm sure he's not going to buy it. He doesn't have any money on him. But he's an idiot. On the other side, Chum liked it so much that he assumed Rick would too. And so he started negotiating with the seller over the price of the float. What are you trying to get for it? $250,000. After a heated negotiation, Chum realized that the price the seller had set was too much for him. So he decided to call Rick, and that's when this happened. Do not buy the float. That was Rick, my boss. He said not to buy the float. And that's when the seller got all heated up. Huh, that's it? Yeah, I'm gonna have to pass. Now that's bull And that's how this deal ended. Triumph Tiger. So you guys look really comfortable. <sighs> With Corey and Chum resting up for a bit, Rick was ready to give them a new task to do. You guys are driving up to Carson City. There's a guy up there with a 1970 650 Tiger Triumph. Rick wanted the Tiger Triumph, and Chum and Corey needed to go and make a deal. The man wanted 10 grand for it, 
but Rick wanted it for eight grand, which he was sure they could negotiate him into. Bring Antoine with you. If it runs good, just buy it for me, okay? Even can I ride my Harley? I don't care what you ride, just go up there and get me the motorcycle. So Chum and Corey went, and even though Corey said before that he did not like Triumphs, this one was surely getting him interested. Exactly as you see it now. It's actually funny, man. I've never liked Triumphs, but this is uh, kind of tickling me a little bit. The man already had the bike fully restored. He just wanted to sell it now for $10,000. But that is when Chum's attention got diverted to another bike the man showed them. Well, that track is sweet. It's as fast as it looks, too. This is what we call our Paco race track. So before sealing the deal, Corey and Chum decided to go have a ride on both bikes and see how it feels to do that. <laughs> These bikes both run great. After getting done with the ride, Corey was now ready to make a deal on the Triumph. What can we really do on the Triumph? We'd like to get $10,000. Corey started off at $6,000 and came up to $7,200. Even though the seller was ready to sell it at $7,500, which was $500 less than what Rick told them, Corey decided to pass on this one. Maybe next time, my man. I'll be around. Thank appreciate you, it. sir. Appreciate it. Hey, thanks for the ride, man. Oh, uh, no. My pleasure. All three of them came back to the shop, and now Corey had to face Rick, who kept asking where the bike was. What happened? Corey wouldn't buy it over $300. The guy was at 7,500 and Corey was stuck at 7,200. According to Corey, he did Rick a favor by not buying it because there was no money to be made, and Rick was furious with them. You know what? This is all my fault. I should have never sent you guys. Thanks a lot, Corey. And that's how this one ended, with Rick being mad and Corey still not seeing how he made the wrong decision. 1884 War Pistol. I've got an 1884 Colt that was in the Wyoming Range Wars and the book that goes with it. This guy came into the pawn shop to sell a gun that was owned by Fred Coates, who was involved in the Wyoming Range Wars. He hoped to get something around 45000 to 50000 for it. So how exactly did you get the gun? According to the man, his father got it from the great-great-granddaughter of Fred Coates, and now he needed to sell it because he needs to give money to his mother. The Range Wars were basically large cattle barons feuding with really small cattle ranchers. With Rick giving every bit of knowledge he had about the Range Wars, he was now ready to move on towards the book. Whoever had the biggest checkbook. <laughs> so what's the deal with the book? The book was written by a newspaper publisher during the Range Wars, and not just that. The man also had the letter from Fred Coates' great-great-granddaughter, which she wrote as documentation for the gun. When you get a letter from Colt, you send him in the serial number, and they send back all their information on that gun. Rick tried matching up the information on the document with the gun, and it all matched up. But before making a deal, Rick had to call in an expert as the man was demanding a whopping $55,000. Well, this is what I called you about. It's an 1884 Colt. I'll agree with that. But he thinks it's historically significant. After asking the seller about it and examining the gun, the Colt letter, and the granddaughter's letter, too. But after seeing everything, the expert came to the conclusion that it was really hard to tell if it was Coates' gun with just that letter. Basically, with, with what we have here, it's really hard to make that connection. The seller looked pretty disappointed with what the expert had to say. And later on, the man said that he did not agree with a single word the expert said. But nonetheless, he had to make the deal. The offer I'd make on it is for a beat up cold single action army. So I'd give you like 1500 bucks. But the seller was not ready to sell it for so little. So he left the shop with his gun and an aim of researching more on it and finding out more evidence. Rare Hollywood document. Got probably one of the rarest Hollywood documents you've ever had come to your store. So first off, who's Harry Carey, if it's not the baseball announcer? So this man came into the pawn shop with a rare Hollywood autograph document. According to him, it might be the rarest document Rick can ever have in his shop. 185 signatures on here. That is pretty cool, but it sort of sucks that they're so... It was cool, but the signatures were so crammed together that they were overlaying one another, and that would be a bad thing, too. With 200 autographs, this might be a new record for the shop. But with this many autographs comes a lot of concerns. So Rick had to call in the expert to see if the document was actually worth the $16,000 the seller was asking for. Well, let's have a look at it. I mean, the first thing I want to do is just... I want to check out the ink on here, and I just want to get a better idea what I'm dealing with. After carefully looking at the piece and making sure that all the signatures are real and not fake, the expert put the price of the piece around $5,000. I value this piece right at about $5,000. Oh, 
Okay. With the experts gone, Rick and the seller started negotiating the price, with Rick offering $3,500 and the seller demanding at least $12,000 for it. I think I'm going to hold on to it, but I thank you very much for the opportunity. Okay, there's no way we're going to be able to make a deal. The seller decided not to sell the document he had and went away, thinking that to the right collector, the piece would be worth way more than what he had even demanded for it. A helicopter. A few days ago, I got a call from my buddy Larry, who repairs helicopters. He says he's got a guy who wants to sell me one. So Rick went to the man expecting some cool helicopter, while what the man actually wanted to sell was not what Rick was expecting. So this is it, huh? No, actually, this is it. What we saw here is an aircraft fully functional, designed by the US military in 1967. But it wasn't designed to bomb or anything, it was actually designed to crash. How much would it be just to rebuild the whole thing? Oh, a uh, thumb sketch uh, estimate would be 100000 It will be an investment of $100,000, but according to the man, when fully restored, the value of the helicopter will easily exceed 150000 What does she want for this thing? I mean, I can't really afford to take anything less than 10. Okay. That huge profit got Rick all interested in the deal. And with so much profit in front of his eyes, Rick did not hesitate even for a second, and the deal was done for $10,000. But before getting the expert started on its restoration, Rick had to tell the old man about it, and this was the reaction. At times, I think he does these things to give me a heart attack so that he can take my share of the business. No matter how much Rick tried, the old man was not convinced. Who's going to fix it? Well, I already got it checked out. 100 grand to get it fixed. What's it worth once it's fixed up? I'm thinking like 150 grand. So Rick had to get it fixed and have the old man see it in person to know that it was not a waste of money. See, I told you it's nice. Well, if it hadn't been Rick, I'd have sold one of your kidneys. Piece the hell out of a hot air balloon. Semi Mosley prototype guitar. I brought something I'd like to show you. Okay. I'm assuming that's a guitar. So this guy walks in with a guitar and claims it's not just any guitar, but a super rare one. He says it's Semi Mosley's personal prototype guitar. A Mosrite. Well, hallelujah. <laughs> Rick was impressed. The guy was thrilled that Rick was impressed. There wasn't much that could go wrong here. Where did you get it? Well, I got it directly from Semi Mosley. According to the guy, he got it straight from Semi Mosley about 44 years ago. By the way, Mosley was a musician who started the Mosrite Guitar Company. Mosley's time, the late 50s, early 60s, gospel, blues, and rock and roll were exploding. And that's when people like Mosley started trying out new sounds, leading to the creation of these prototypes. I mean, it looks brand new. I mean, we have, there's one little chip here, but there's no belt buckle marks on it. That's definitely cool. So based on Rick's investigation, the guitar is in really good shape. It has a few marks, but that's no big deal. It's even listed in the celebrity registry and considered the rarest well-known guitar out there. It sounds really, really cool. Lots of famous bands and musicians used Mosley guitars, so they still hold value in the pawn market today. And just like the guy said, if this is the original personal prototype guitar, it could definitely be sold. How much do you want for it? Well, it's about the rarest prototype guitar that exists. The guy can't stop raving about how rare and special it is. He claimed it could easily fetch somewhere between two hundred and two hundred and fifty thousand dollars at an auction. It would bring somewhere between two hundred thousand and two hundred and fifty thousand. But since this is a shop and not an auction, he's willing to take a hundred thousand dollars for it. Well, Rick's face said it all. I'd take a hundred thousand for it. Quite frankly, that sounds expensive. Rick wasn't sure about its actual value, so he told the guy he'd bring in an expert. And then things took an interesting turn. So I've had this guitar since 1969 continuously and got it from the guy who made it. I am considered the industry expert on this guitar. Well, Rick had to call his expert, and he did. The expert confirmed it was the original prototype guitar and estimated its value at around $25,000. The guy selling it was pretty disappointed. That's absolutely ridiculous because it's been appraised over the years. According to the guy, it's worth way more. And he kept arguing angrily with the expert, who was just giving his opinion based on his knowledge. Well, the guitar has been insured for $100,000 or better. I, I mean, I can insure my shoes for $100,000 with an insurance company. They argued back and forth until the expert finally left. And Rick knew there was no deal happening that day. Damn stupid. <sighs> Fine. Dumb kid. We all make mistakes, Rick. It'll be okay. 
<laughs> there are times when pawn stars fool others, and there are times when they get fooled by others. From fake Napoleon letters and Donald Duck bikes, here are times when customers scam pawn stars causing losses. Napoleon letter. So what do we got? This is a letter signed by Napoleon himself. This man came into the shop with a letter that he claimed was signed by Napoleon, and he purchased it online. This is the type of seal they used back then, so it does look right for the period. Not only did it appear authentic to Corey, but the seller also provided some paperwork. Corey was very interested in buying the letter. The man wanted 10 grand for it, but Corey was only willing to offer 1500. Corey believed that since Napoleon may have signed many things, the letter was less rare and therefore less valuable. How about uh, five? You're gonna have to come a lot lower than that, man. I can't pay you 5,000. In the end, they agreed on a price of $2,000, and the deal was made. However, Corey forgot to consult an expert before finalizing the transaction. Original Napoleon document with certificate of authenticity. The Napoleon? Yep. The first thing Rick and the old man asked was whether Corey had the document checked by someone, which, of course, he did not. Rick advised him to get it authenticated before putting it on the shelf. This is it, man. It's supposed to be an original document signed by Napoleon. After examining everything, the expert concluded that what Corey had brought to him was not an original document written by Napoleon, but rather a replica. So what we've got here is very clearly a replica of a very important document. <clears throat> Corey not only had to deal with the loss he just incurred, but also with Rick and the old man. <sighs> Fine. Dumb kid. Indian vest. I have a Sioux Youth Vest. Okay. An 1819 Youth Indian Vest is what this man brought onto the ship with the hopes of selling it at a good price of $1,800. And how much were you looking for? Um, I was looking at $1,800. With a price so reasonable and something so old and unique, Rick was ready to make a deal without having anyone come over to check the authenticity of the vest. And the deal got done at $1,300. All right, I'm gonna go with that. With the man gone, it was time to have the expert come over and see how much profit Rick made, or in this case, if he even made a profit or not. It looks to be Sioux or it's it's Northern Plains beadwork, unfortunately. I don't think this is from that time period. And when the expert saw it, he knew it was not what Rick thought it was. The vest wasn't fake, it was Indian made, but it wasn't that old and was just made for sale, more like a souvenir. And with Rick making this mistake, Corey couldn't help but smile. I mean, we all make mistakes. I mean, who would have thought the Indian vest would have turned out to be real? Big Donald Duck Bike. What do you have there? Oh, yeah. My boss is going to love this. What this man brought was a big Donald Duck Bike, and Chum instantly knew that Rick was going to love it. So he asked the seller to bring the bike in and have Rick make a deal for it. Hey, Rick. This is absolutely great. The seller saw this bike on a website, and being a fan of Disney, he knew he had to get it. But when it arrived, it turned out to be a small bike meant for kids. So he thought, why not try to sell it for $3,000? This is really cool. Donald Duck is quite the character. After a whole lecture on how Donald Duck surpassed Mickey Mouse and how they became the best-selling bicycles of their time, Rick noticed a few things that needed to be restored before making the bike available for sale. Then he was ready to make the deal. Um, how much do you want for it? I'd like to get 3000 for it. After a little bit of negotiation, Rick got the bike for $2250, and then he was ready to have it restored and see what it would look like. Donald Duck said it's fine. So while the expert restored everything, including the horn that now works and the eyes of Donald Duck, the tank, the paint, and everything else, he noticed one tiny thing. I got some bad news. It's not a true Donald. It's a clone. It's a fake Donald Duck bike? And yeah, it was just a big Donald Duck bike that Rick bought for almost two grand and then spent 350 more to get it restored. So it's not a true Donald Duck. Now I'd be lucky to get a thousand bucks. Gibson mandolin. I have a Gibson mandolin. Mind if I play a couple tones? Sure. A Gibson mandolin showed up at the store, and the seller walked to Chum Lee, who got very much interested in playing with it. This dude, Orville Gibson, started making instruments way back in the late 1800s. And let me tell you, that thing was legit. 
it can be worth a ton of money. That is, if the Pawn Star guys get the deal right. All right, well, let me call my boss over here. So John went to call Rick and Corey to handle the deal. But guess what? Those guys weren't around, man. So poor Chum was left to handle everything on his own. I guess no one's here. No, I know a little bit about these things. They're from the early 1930s. Considering its age, that mandolin looked pretty good, don't you think? My spinning limit's like a thousand bucks, but I think this thing might be worth risking a little bit more. Now, he's gonna take a big risk here, but come on, Chum Lee, at least call an expert or someone, dude. What are you trying to get for well, it? Well, I'd like to get three grand out of it if I could. I'd say three grand is all right, not too shabby. Because normally, you know, I actually have a spinning limit of a thousand bucks. I'm not supposed to go any higher than that. The seller doesn't need to sell it right away, but for Rick, it's easy money, you know? After some haggling, Rick offered a cool 14 grand. I'll go 14, and that's pushing the barrel. 15 sounds fair. I can make a 15? profit. All right, that sounds good. I appreciate it. And that's a done deal. But after buying the mandolin, Chum thought it would be a good idea to get a check by an expert. And man, that's when the bad news hit him. Cut out with some scissors. On this mandolin, it would have been inlaid or silk screened. It wouldn't even have been a decal. Yep, that's how our buddy Chum got fooled once again. Willie Mays uniform. What do we got? Hey, I got this 61 uh, Willie Mays uniform. This guy showed up claiming to have Willie Mays' actual uniform, the one he wore back in the day. Now, for those of you who don't know, Willie Mays was a baseball legend. If what this guy had was legit, it would be worth a fortune. You're bringing me in something here that's amazing. The home runs this guy could have hit in this uniform, the bases he stole, game-winning catches, all kinds of stuff. I get it. Corey got all excited because it's a piece of history. But I couldn't see any signs that it was actually worn by a baseball player who hit all those home runs. I mean, there was no scratches or anything. My uncle acquired it in the late 60s, and when he passed away, my aunt just kept good care of it. And about two and a half years ago, she was nice enough to give it to me. But I gotta admit, it does look pretty amazing. I mean, if it really was the uniform of a legendary player, I'd be tempted to buy it. But still, it looks brand new to me. Do you have any paperwork or anything with you? Or? No, I don't. Okay. That was the first thing that raised a red flag for me. This doesn't look game worn. Willie Mays was a badass. He was sliding around in the dirt and the grass. I imagine there would be a bunch of stains on it. Even Chum could tell it should have some stains or something, you know? What'd you want to do with it? I'd like to sell it. Give me an idea of what you want for it. I think around 45,000 would be a fair. So 45,000 bucks is a decent amount for something genuine, I guess. But we need an expert to give their opinion and tell us if it's worth it. What do we got? Check it out, it's a Willie Mays uniform. See, we would need to see a lot more evidence of wear on it. This is 100% authentic jersey that Willie Mays was issued. Great, good to hear. So if it's real but not actually game worn, what's its actual value? This is absolutely extraordinary. This is one hell of a find. I would value this anywhere from 35 to 40 grand. The experts say it's worth 45,000, which is exactly what the guy wants. But Corey isn't gonna let him off that easily. I'll give you 20 grand for it. Uh, no, I, I can't. Did you uh, do 40? And so the bargaining continued until they finally agreed on $31,000. Sounds good. All right, mm. John, take care of it. But that wasn't the end of it. The baseball jersey ended up selling for only $12,000, making it one of Corey's biggest mistakes. Joe Jackson. I have a book signed by Shoeless Joe Jackson. Yeah, just like Rick, we all got surprised when he found that book was Shoeless Joe Jackson's actual signature. It's actually signed by him. Right. When we talk about old baseball players, Joe Jackson is at the top. So yeah, it was a really rare book. The guy just walked into the pawn shop with... Do you know how rare it is to find his signature? No, not at all. It's the rarest sports signature, period. Wow. And wow, the guy himself had no clue about the amazing piece of history he had in his hands. Shoeless Joe Jackson was a baseball legend. He was such a good hitter, Babe Ruth actually copied his style. And Rick is right. If it weren't for the scandal, Joe Jackson would have easily made it to the Hall of Fame. The first one isn't very legible, and then the second one is clearly different than the first one. This actually has a story behind it, and that's what Rick is here to tell us. He could not read, and um, his wife signed everything for him. I just found out about this today, to be honest. All the signed copies of this book, most of them, everyone you see will have this in it. 
Shoeless Joe Jackson signed by his wife. So if the book had both signatures, it meant it was the rarest one of its kind, which of course means more money. So um, we have a certificate of authenticity, we have the book. So how much did you want to get out of it? And now we're getting down to business. I did a, uh, a quick search on his signature and found that there's not many of them. I'd like to get like 30,000 for the book. 30,000 bucks is a decent amount, I guess, considering the book is genuine. Rick didn't think he needed an expert to check it out. Um, I'm thinking closer to 10 grand. He still won't bring an expert to confirm if the signature is real or not. 10 grand just for a gamble? So, I mean, I'll take a shot at 10 grand. Let's see what happens. It's just not a signature. It's on a book about the dark side of sports. Yeah, but it's not the book itself that's worth anything. It's the signature. I mean, that has to bring something to the table. I'll give you 11. How about 16,000? I still say you need to call an expert. I'll make it short and sweet. I'll go $13,000 and we'll go a penny more. I mean, ask for $1 more, you can just pick the book up and leave. And he's going to take it, of course. It was just a book anyway. OK, let, let's do it. All right, deal, man. Great. However, where Rick thought he made himself a nice profit, you got to see what happened later. So what the expert told Rick was that the signature did not match the one all the authenticators can agree on. Hence, it was not real as far as she knew. But still, there was hope, as the signature of Joe Jackson has always been so controversial that if Rick could somehow get the consensus of the community, then maybe that book and the signature could be considered real and be worth some money. They call sculpture. Hey. This guy walked into the store with a sculpture and claimed he knew nothing about it, but he wanted to sell it. I have a bronze statue I like to sell. Do you know much about it? I don't know what to tell you about that. But Rick had all the knowledge about it. He knew it was a statue called Pegasus, and the person on it was Perseus, the mythological hero who killed Medusa. The helmet on the figure made him invisible. Armed with this information, here's how the seller reacted. I, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> The statue was so cool that even the old man seemed really impressed by it. Okay. Rick, it's a quality piece. I don't know the sculptor. The statue was made by Bacall and belonged to 1880, making it quite rare and possibly valuable. But that's when Rick noticed something. What doesn't look right is there's some pity right here. And that crack right there is from when they cast it. It didn't happen later. So there were some problems, and that made Rick doubt whether the artwork was authentic or not. If it's an original, the casting will all be right. Rick concluded that there's a chance the statue was remade 40 or 50 years ago and wasn't an original piece. This made the seller really angry. The original was made in 1888. I don't believe you. Even after explaining everything, the seller just refused to believe that what he had was not the original. To see in which you can prove is two different stories. This obviously made Rick angry because he was only trying to tell the truth, but some people don't want to listen. I see this all the time. People will bring in things like this, and I tell them it's not real, and they just think I'm a call. Nevertheless, Rick continued to explain the details of the art piece over and over again, only to hear this. I don't care what you say. I don't care what you tell me, but I know you're full of You know? <laughs> the old man and the security guard had to step in to keep the seller calm, as he blamed everything on Rick. We might be wrong. We don't know. We're in the business to make money. We're going to back off. And the man left, thinking it was the pawn shop's loss, not his, as he still believed he had the genuine statue in his possession. Every single thing in my store, all like 17,000 items, has had a police report filed on it. You don't want. A counterfeit bill is not legal to own. Pawn stars usually get the most unique and rare items on their show, but there are times when they have to deal with stolen goods counterfeit bills, and expensive jewelry with removed engravings. With that said, let's start today's video. Harley Davidson This man came into the pawn shop with a Harley Davidson, and even though Corey couldn't help but admire it, he had to make sure the bike wasn't stolen. You got any paperwork I can see on it? Or Yeah, I got the title, but can we negotiate first or something? I mean, <laughs> I got to make sure it's not stolen first. So the owner wanted to negotiate first and then show the paperwork for the bike. And that's what got Corey a little suspicious. So he asked for the papers before starting to negotiate about the bike. On the title here, man, it says Diana. You told me your name was Davey. After checking out the papers, Corey found out that the name of the paperwork was different from what the man told him, which made it clear that the seller wasn't the owner of the bike and it was probably stolen from someone else. Every single thing in my store, all like 17,000 items, 
has had a police report filed on it. So our dear seller might have been arrested by the police later because what Corey found out was wrong information on the paper, and he went to check it in their computers and look for the real owner of the bike. A counterfeit bill. What do we got? I have some political memorabilia, the Secret Service ID for J. Howard McGrath, Attorney General of the United States. So this man came into the pawn shop with some Secret Service IDs, a White House pass, and a $10 bill with some signatures. He had some thousand figures in his head for all those things, but Rick needed to find out more about these things before starting to make a deal. Where did you get these? I bought them from his grandson. All right. So after talking a little bit about J. Howard McGrath, Attorney General of the United States, discussing how he was the power player of Washington politics and all, Rick was now ready to make a deal. But there was just a little bit of a problem. Counterfeit money? That's a whole different story. It's a federal offense to use a counterfeit bill, so I'm assuming you can't own one. After checking it all, Rick came to the conclusion that the dollar bill the man brought in was counterfeit, and not just the bill. Rick had a feeling that it might be a felony to own the other stuff as well, so he had to call on the expert to see if he could buy these things or not. Well, this is a counterfeit bill, so... <laughs> counterfeit? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> According to the expert, the Secret Service credential and the White House pass were real and okay to buy. However, the counterfeit bill was another story. That, on the other hand, you don't want. A counterfeit bill is not legal to own. So with the expert gone, Rick was now ready to make a deal. He asked the seller what he wanted for the things other than the counterfeit bill. I'd like $1,000. <sighs> and the deal was done at $500, with the seller leaving the shop with the cash and the illegal bill. Let's hope he turned that counterfeit bill into the Secret Service. Orange Bowl Ring. Got a Penn State University 1973 Orange Bowl Ring. Okay. So this man brought in a 1973 Penn State Orange Bowl ring. He needed money for remodeling his house, so he was in the shop to sell it. And he thought it must be worth at least $1,500. Hey, what's up? Let me check that out. Penn State Orange Bowl ring. According to the seller, a guy who was on the team needed some money, and all he had was that ring. So the man bought this ring and gave him the money he needed. And with such a big following, there's people that collect anything Penn State. On the one side has a player's name and his number. The ring belonged to a player called Jeff Park, who didn't play too much and was a linebacker at the time, but he was a part of the team nonetheless. <laughs> what are you looking to get out of it? The man wanted 1500 just like he mentioned before, but Rick needed to take a closer look before starting to negotiate for the ring. That's when he found out that something was wrong with the ring. I got a problem with this ring. What's that? Engraving's been removed on it. Ooh. The engraving makes the ring 100% identifiable, so even though the ring was cool, the price was reasonable. With the engravings removed, it became illegal for Rick to buy or sell this ring. But it's illegal for me to buy or sell anything when any identifying mark has been removed on an item. The seller found it a little hard to see how, with just some engravings removed, the ring became illegal to buy or sell. So Rick and Corey had to explain to him in detail and tell him that no matter how much they wanted to, they just can't take it. Okay. All right, dude. Okay. Sorry, I couldn't do nothing with it. Okay. Gun desk. So what do we got here? Well, it's a desk, but it's not really a desk. So what this woman brought into the pawn shop wasn't something anyone usually sees there. It was something that looked like a simple desk, but it was something way more than that. It's actually a gun. It's a gun desk. So when you push down the inkwell, a bullet fires out through the trap door. And that's how this desk becomes a gun when the time comes. If I sell it, that's fine. If I don't, I'm okay with that too. So the seller basically came to the shop to not just sell the gun desk, but also to know a little bit more about it. She wanted to know to whom it belonged, how it was used, how old it was, and stuff like that. Where in the world did you get this? I got it in an estate sale. I was just looking for a nice little desk to put a guest book on. Well, looking for a nice little desk, she came across this one. But when she got it home and was trying to open it up, that's when she realized it wasn't what she thought it was. I've seen guns concealed in all kinds of things. I've seen desks with hidden gun compartments, but I've never seen a desk as a gun. To Rick, it was something straight out of a James Bond movie. And he was so interested in it that he even forgot that he was literally sticking his face into a gun. It's not loaded. Why are you sticking your face in there? Uh, th um, this is why I'm keeping at an angle here. 
After having a closer look, Rick decided it was better to have an expert come look at it, so he called one. So where's the gun? This is the gun. What? <laughs> the expert himself had never seen anything like that before, and he had no idea what exactly it was used for. But from what the expert saw, he could tell that it was made somewhere between 1890 and 1910, and that was an issue. Even though he couldn't guarantee it, it was a gray area for the Pawn Stars to buy it. Tell you one way or the other for absolute certainty. So if I can't guarantee it, it's, it's a gray area for you and it's not worth the risk. The only way it can be legal to buy and sell is to have it taken to a gunsmith and have him deactivate the mechanism. Only then can it be bought and sold easily and legally. Oh, I'd love to do that, Ben. I'll, that's okay. what I'll do. I wish I could help you out more. It's just one of those things. Wells Fargo Strongbox. What do we have here? Well, we got a Wells Fargo Strongbox. This man brought a Wells Fargo Strongbox with an antique ball and chain and a few old handcuffs. The seller was looking for something around $2,000 for everything in that box. All right, well, tell me about these things. This ball and chain right here uh, actually comes from the human prison. It was the oldest prison in the state of Arizona, and the handcuffs belonged to Folsom Prison from around the late 1800s. Here's my concerns. When they forged chains back in the 1800s, it was just hot welding together. You know, get it hot, beat it together. Back then, it was all done by the blacksmith. But what the man brought in, those chains were all electrically welded. And it wasn't just that. Rick had another big concern, too. Never in the history of any prison did they ever have their name put on the balls. What Rick was saying is that the stuff the man brought in was all fake. But the seller was not ready to believe what Rick was saying. It's fake. What, what makes you an expert on this stuff? But even though the stuff inside the box was fake, there was a chance that the box might not be. So Rick decided to make a deal for the box and leave the rest. Box, I'll give you 400 bucks for it. I want $1,200 for it. No, you don't. And the deal got done at 450 bucks. The seller went out, and it was later when Rick decided to call on the expert to have a look at what he had bought. Okay. 19th century strong box. Wells Fargo. After looking carefully at the box and having it all examined, the first thing the expert asked Rick was this. First things first, have you already bought this? That sounds bad. The box was just as fake as the other stuff that Rick did not buy, and the expert had the same thing to say. It's a complete fake. Damn it, Rick. A guitar. Hey, how can I help you? I have this guitar here, and I wasn't sure whether or not I could legally sell it. At first, it looked like a normal guitar to Rick, and he was wondering why anyone would need to know if it was legal to buy or not. But when he flipped it over, the tortoise shell was there, and that explained why the seller was concerned. It's a tortoise shell. Okay. <laughs> the man did not have any idea what the guitar was worth, but if he sold it somehow, the money would go for his daughter's college. Where in the world did you get this? He bought it from a pawn shop, and for some reason, he was drawn towards it. But after he brought it home, he tried doing a little bit of research on it and found out that the UK government had confiscated one they found. So he had to make sure if it was legal to own or not. But my problem here at the moment is, I don't know if it's early 70s or older, which would determine whether it's legal for me to buy this thing. So Rick was unsure about it and thought it had a big chance of being legal. He had to call the expert in and have it checked out. This is the guitar I called you about. Wow, the sea turtle maybe? The expert found it was quite interesting, and when asked if it was legal to own, the expert said it was okay to own. But selling it might be a little bit of a problem because people have been arrested and fined in the past for selling stuff like this illegally. 10 months of in-house arrest and paid like 20 grand in fines for selling this stuff illegally. With this, Rick couldn't buy the guitar, and the seller had to go back home with just his guitar, no money, and hundreds of concerns. Golden State Warriors ring. I just got engaged, and I heard you had a 75 Golden State Warriors ring, and I was thinking that would be perfect for my fiance. This man came into the shop to buy something, which is rather unusual as we usually see people coming into the shop to buy their stuff. However, this man was interested in the 1975 Golden State Warriors ring that Rick had in the shop. But Rick couldn't help but find this amusing. That is a brave man that would give his fiance a championship ring. Must have really big hands. <laughs> Even though Rick can't stop laughing, wondering why the man is gifting a ring like this to his fiance, we can see that the buyer is not looking very happy about Rick laughing like that. So what I did was I brought pictures of another 75 Golden State Warriors ring. The buyer had brought pictures of another Golden State Warriors ring and tried matching them up, which they did. 
Then he proceeded to ask if it was a real diamond and if Rick had checked it out or not. Rick assured him that it was a real diamond. Have you tested the diamond? Oh, yeah, it's a real diamond. It's a real diamond, okay. Now, the buyer went forward and took out his own tester to check if the diamond was real or not, as, according to him, he was a collector and a broker of sports memorabilia himself. But when he tried checking the diamond, it wasn't testing. It's not a testing. Uh, that's because you have a really cheap tester. So Rick went in and brought his own tester, which of course showed that the diamond was real. Even though Rick got a little annoyed during the whole process, he still decided to be nice to the man. We're spot on mine. Okay. I will uh, trust that. With the ring tested and all, the buyer asked for the price, which was $11,500 according to Rick. But what the buyer had in mind was an amount of $5,500. Any, any, uh, 11 grand. That's 11, what I can do. That's your bottom line. Yeah. Okay. Best price. Since Rick wouldn't go any lower than $11,000, the buyer had to walk out of the shop disappointed and empty handed. I didn't think he was going to go 5500 but I thought, you know, he'd work with me a little bit, but he seemed like he wanted to punch me in the face.